Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we are going to continue the reassembly of the Ferrari engine. Alright guys, welcome back to Home Built and those of you who are watching last week will have seen that I spent a lot of time putting the cam covers back on and then I had to make up these sort of mounting brackets for all of the coil packs. And uh, there are lots of sort of questions going, why didn't you do this, why didn't you do that? There's, there's, uh, there was method to my madness. So um, a lot of people were asking about these things saying, why didn't I 3D print them? You know, I can design them and I could have 3D printed them, but A, the 3D printing doesn't look as nice, um, unless you really go to town and paint it or tidy it up, uh, or unless you have access to a really good high quality 3D printer, which I've got a basic 3D printer and you can see all the layers and it's not that good. And also I'm worrying about it warping in the heat of the engine bay. Um, as many of you have mentioned, this engine bay is probably gonna get quite hot and they would probably warp and sort of, they just wouldn't end up being as, as nice. Whereas these actually work the part, They I think they look really good. They're Definitely going to handle the heat and they'll be fine for all of that. Uh, there were other people saying, why didn't you uh, sort of tack weld them together so they're not separate pieces? And if I did that, I did consider it briefly, but uh, the issue is, is that then I'll probably have to paint them as one thing and then you sort of see these weird gaps all the way around where I have to sort of tack together. Or I could have to weld them all the way around, which would have taken forever. It would have probably warped them and made all sorts of issues that I have to sort out, then tidy them up, then paint them. It's a whole lot more work. Um, a manual mill would have been would be great to uh, to have, but again, that would have taken a long time, a lot of time on a mill, which I don't have. So uh, the uh, the fact that the, the way that I did it, I think worked out the best way. Again. Uh, having the two layers there, when they're painted the different colours, looks intentional and looks sort of professional. If they've got just sort of two layers sort of stuck there, you're sort of like, well, it looks a bit of an afterthought, and I, I don't like that. So I, I think that was uh, um, one of the, uh, the the best methods, and I, and I think they look really good. I've got some stainless cap head bolts on the base here. Um, oh, that was another thing that people were bringing up. They were saying, oh, well, because they're two pieces, they're fiddly, you're going to lose them. Now that they're in... You don't have to take them off potentially ever again. You can take off the coil packs and change the spark plugs without taking these base plates off. Even on the other side, the top bolt stays on there. The bottom bolt is shared through the coil pack. So you can take that bolt off, take the coil pack off, take the spark plug out all through that hole and, uh, and then put it back on again without removing the top bolts or without removing these plates. So they can stay there. They don't have to be removed. They're uh, actually not the only fiddly time was the initial assembly. So I'm quite happy with uh, how that turned out. There are also lots of comments about these caps that I've got in the engine bay about if I'm labeling the caps, uh, are they interchangeable? And could somebody accidentally put the washer cap onto the dry sump tank and the dry sump tank onto the washer cap? cap? Potentially, yes, somebody in the future could, which is, as I said, some people said that's an argument for labeling in the engine bay. I just don't see how I can label it in the engine bay and it look nice and not look like a sort of tacky afterthought. Um, and I'm happy enough labeling the top of the caps. The likelihood is you're never gonna open the washer jet to refill that at the same time you're gonna have the, uh, the dry sun tank off. I'm never gonna make that mistake. Somebody else potentially could make that mistake, but as I said, the likelihood is so low, uh, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned. I like to keep the symmetrical look. Uh, so I, I, I want it to look nice and neat. I like the colors, I like the black and just keeping it uh, the way it is, I, I personally think that the way, the way it looks the best. So um, yeah, I think I still, my plan is to get some discs, cut some discs out, get them laser etched and, uh, and sort of uh, stick them over the top so that they'll just look nice and neat and professional and uh, that's the way to go. So today's task is to continue assembling this engine. At the moment, this uh, inlet manifold is only just sitting on here. Uh, I don't have injectors, fuel rails, no, the, none of the wiring. And I also need to look at a couple of extra braces I need to make up and also a way to be able to lift this in and out of the engine bay as one thing. Because I don't want to have to take this inlet manifold off every time I want to remove it from the engine bay. Hopefully it doesn't happen very often, but if it does, 
that adds a whole extra level of complication, which means because all the wires run through this manifold, it means I have to disconnect all the wiring and all that sort of stuff, and I've got bulkhead connectors. The more I can leave this together and just put it all in and out as one piece and make it nice and simple, the better. And that is the plan. So um, moving forward, let's go and grab some bits and see what we want to bolt on. Alright, so you saw me just then, I uh, bolted on my engine mounts for good and I've also got the oil outlet here bolted back on. So this is one that I modified so that it can go forward to the oil cooler. So basically the oil exits the engine here, goes to the oil cooler, comes into the dry sump tank and then back into the engine here into my um, adapter plate which then curves around and goes in and sort of follows into the engine here and then gets picked up at the sump and goes back up again. So that is the sort of the, the flow of the engine. When I say the sump, it's a dry sump, there is not much of a sump here. But um, yes, the next thing I'm going to tackle is putting on the headers. Now, um, many of you who watched previously will have seen that um, I could not build tune length, tune length headers. There is zero room. I mean, lots of people complain about not having enough room for headers. This is to the extreme because the steering uh, column comes in right here where I had to clearance the, um, the, uh, the body away. I've got the engine mounts here and I've got, um, and also there's like this suspension uh, upper knuckle is right here. So there was no room at all. And I've sent them away and got them ceramic coated. And they're looking really nice. Um, as you can see, like you can see how tight they are by how tight I had to build this. You can see this one here. I couldn't even do a, um, a proper bend into it. I just had to suck it in that tight because I needed this clearance here. And even as it is, there's only about 10 millimeters clearance to fit this in the car. So yes, it's a compromise, but that's just how it is. So uh, I've got some new exhaust manifold gaskets. I can put them on and let's start bolting on some headers. All right, the headers are on and they are looking really nice. They, uh, like I said, they don't get seen, but they look great. And speaking of things that don't get seen, but are definitely required to make this uh, whole car run the way I want, is the alternator. Now, many of you will have seen that I put this alternator on the car. I made this custom sort of bracket here. Uh, it's quite sort of ugly and heavy to hold it. and. This was actually out of a Camry because I couldn't fit the factory uh, Ferrari alternator which sat on the other side and there was just no room. So I modified this uh, to fit. And um, I sort of didn't really know what I was gonna do. I was thinking about getting it upgraded. And what I did is I talked to Wasp Engineering and uh, these guys make stonking alternators and starter motors and all that sort of stuff. I've actually got one of these in Harry, my uh, 911. Basically, uh, that car has uh, an air electric air conditioning system, so it needs a lot of power and it needs a big alternator. So it's got a, uh, I think it makes more than double the power of what the, uh, the standard automator Max did at idle. So um, this, this alternator that uh, Wasp have made up for me, which is, Fantastic, it's a 175 amp alternator. It's a stonking alternator. Um, and uh, this thing is uh, roughly the, uh, the sort of, it's, it's, it's roughly the same size as the um, Camry one. There's uh, not a lot of difference, but it does mount slightly differently. So that means that this current bracket is not gonna do the job, which means I need to now make up another bracket to hold my very pretty, very, uh, yeah, very nice alternator. So let's start um, redoing and uh, re-looking at what I've already done. I've already done it once. Let's do some design work and see what we can come up with as far as making a mount to fit uh, this very pretty alternator.
All right, so I've been playing around with my new alternator, trying to work out exactly where it's going to fit and how I'm going to make the bracket or modify my bracket to uh, make it work. I cut off the old tensioner end, which is here, and because uh, it was sort of, it was interfering, it was in the wrong spot. And this alternator is slightly different in the fact that uh, it's basically, um, the tabs are aligned top and bottom, whereas my Camry alternator, they're offset. You can see here they're offset to the sides, so the tension is all completely different. So I've got to try and make it work. And what I'm thinking is I actually, instead of having the pivot all the way in here on the alternator and having these tabs stick out, because I'm really tight and um, I don't particularly want to be test fitting in and out of the car, um, what I'm going to do is I can, I've actually sort of taken some measurements, I've worked out what will roughly, roughly work, and um, I want to actually move this pivot point, so instead of being all the way in, I want to move the pivot point out, which means I'll keep this uh, current tab, and I'll probably weld onto that my new pivot point, and that will then make the, uh, the tabs more vertical, so if it was in here, the tab starts sticking out a long way, Whereas if it's like that, the, uh, the tab is all underneath and all of the adjustment is underneath the alternator, which is, uh, which is a much better way in my case for it to fit. So um, first things first is I need to build that pivot um, and I'm gonna do it the same way as I did last time because that was uh, sort of a nice easy way to do it. So I've got a big chunk of this bar stock, big heavy solid steel bar stock. So uh, let's cut off a piece and start turning it on the lathe and uh, get it so that it'll actually be my new pivot. Definitely getting much better on the lathe as I go. Um, just, you know, like all these things, you just need practice. But uh, there's my fitting, just uh, spun down, simple block. I haven't cleaned up the uh, sides of it. That's just gonna get a quick scotch bright up and uh, and get ready to weld, but that'll fit in there nicely. It's a nice pivot, it's a perfect fitment. It's not too tight, it's not too loose. It's just right. I've got about um, 0 0.1 millimeter of gap, which is exactly what I wanted. So let's go and start working out how we're going to fit it to the mount. Okay, so I've got uh, the beginnings of my mount here that I'm going to attach to the previous mount, but I need to work out the offset and where in space this needs to go so that A, we can tension it, and B, that it's all in line and the belt is gonna run straight and true. So how I'm gonna do that is I've got my straight edge, I run that across my front pulley, so I've got a nice level straight line, and then using my caliper, I can measure the distance from the straight edge to the old mounting point. And by doing some other calculations, by working out where the previous wheel is to that mounting point, work out then the distance I need for the new mounting point to be at the same spot. And basically, uh, I've uh, done the calculations, I think it's 5.5 millimeters. This mounting point needs to be mounted 5.5 millimeters this way, so this is in the same line, so that the pulley will line up and it will all hopefully work. What I'm thinking is because this is a big chunky lump, it doesn't necessarily need to be this big, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the hexagonal section just in the bit that lines up with the, uh, the old hexagonal section so I can weld them together, and the rest I'm just gonna turn down on the lathe. It'll help me locate it and, uh, and just make the whole thing a lot easier so I can do it quite accurately on the lathe and take off that sort of 5.5 millimeters and then do the same on the back and so we get it to mount up nicely. Easy to weld, easy to line up. Let's start doing some work. Basically, the bracket that I made previously, that line there is perfectly in line with the engine and keeping this at the right tilt, I've got it flat on the table and then it's also flat with this. So, so basically, I've got the two levels of direction worked out by bracing this together and then I actually put a straight edge on the edge right here 
to make sure that these two things, it's hard to do it while I'm holding the camera, but those are perfectly in line and that depth is exactly 5.5 millimeters, which is exactly what I wanted so that I can get the alternator pulley perfectly in line with the, uh, with the main pulleys. So that'll be a nice bracket that hopefully won't throw alternator belts. Well, we have a working mount for my alternator. So it's not pretty, It's uh, I just reused what I had made up previously. Uh, now, if I did it all again from the scratch, I would probably design it all up in CAD and it would be much prettier, but uh, it does the job. It's hidden down the bottom of the engine and it works. So um, basically I took the tensioner off of the Camry, the temp tensioner, and basically, it just screws in and out like like so. That tensions it. And then if I screw the bolt in on the back, it will actually lock it into place. So it's got sort of uh, double tensioning features there. It should uh, fit in quite nicely. It's got plenty of range of movement. I've done a bunch of measuring to make sure it will still fit in the engine bay. It still uh, takes up roughly the same dimensional uh, space that the previous one did. So now it's just a matter of painting it up and that will be another piece done for the engine. Moving on. Just as I was moving on, I was getting ready so that I can put my uh, top inlet manifold back on again. And just off camera, I was uh, bolting on this little water jacket manifold here. And I don't actually have the correct gasket. So I made up some gaskets myself. Just quickly, I thought I'd just do it off camera. Just made up some gaskets out of uh, some rubberized cork that would seal up the water galleries. And I was just going through by the manual and talking up these bolts to spec. What I didn't factor in is that the rubberized gasket is obviously softer. It's actually uh, pressing out. This side talked up fine. I was just uh, talking up the last bolt and the manifold, I can see it's just cracked all the way through the, uh, the mounting tab. <sighs> Great. This gasket probably didn't need that much torque because it's a rubberized uh, cork gasket, it's um, yeah, on the, uh, the water gallery. It would seal pretty well easily and yeah, I don't know whether it's been, whether it's weak, whether it's been sitting off, but now it's cracked, which means that's a whole new thing that I have to deal with. Hmm. All right, I pulled it off and I might have actually gotten away with it, mostly because uh, it hasn't cracked all the way through. It's still fine on the other side. So what I should be able to do is uh, grind back those little spots there and weld it in. It's aluminium, I can weld in those corners. What I might do is I'm gonna, I'm going to bolt this all to a plate to stop it from warping. Um, so hopefully if I bolt it all down, grind it out and weld it up back up and uh, let it cool like that, hopefully it will stay flat and then I'll be able to bolt it down and uh, yeah, not mess it up. All right, so this uh, water jacket, whatever you want to call it, is uh, now repaired. Painted up, looks a lot nicer and neater and ready to go back on. Now, I mentioned that uh, I didn't cover the gaskets, uh, but uh, I will uh, briefly now. These are the gaskets that I made up. Um, making up gaskets, you can buy a bunch of different gasket materials from most auto repair shops, uh, wherever. This is, uh, this is actually like you know, proper gasket material that I used. And uh, to make up gaskets like this, it's relatively straightforward. Basically, all I do is I, I get the piece I need to get a gasket for, um, and I use the dirty finger trick. So holding over, holding a piece of paper over uh, where you want to make the gasket, and it's probably hard to do this on uh, while, while you're watching, but by rubbing my dirty finger over the edges, there you can see that I actually have the uh, 
the outline of the gasket. So what I, what I generally do is I just put a little bit of self-adhesive on the back and I stick it onto a piece of my gasket material and then cut around with some scissors around the edge. And for the holes, I've got some of these punches, which are just uh, like, a, yeah, like a, a round metal punch. Just sit it on top and, uh, and, and punch the hole through for these holes either end. And then I'll punch a couple of holes around the inside and then cut around the rest and you've got a gasket. Alright, so the inlet manifold is now bolted down with nice new gaskets and uh, now it's time to fit my modified fuel rails. Now, uh, some of you might remember that uh, um, I actually cooked a couple of the injectors. They're actually all uh, melted and stuff. So I've got uh, two replacement injectors from Raceworks. So uh, let's swap these in. I'm going to put a little bit of uh, rubber grease around them and, uh, and then fit them up and uh, that'll be another job marked off. All right, so the fuel rails are in and I forgot that I was waiting for future Jeff to turn up some spacers to, uh, to put in to space out the fuel rails, similar to what I made on these here. So uh, let's go to the lathe and make up some spacers. Alright, that is coming together. I know all this stuff is slow, but it just takes time. That's uh, two and a half days of work down to, uh, to get to this point. But it doesn't help when I break things. Uh, so it's looking much better. But uh, having this, uh, this bracket, I know it's, it's ugly, but uh, you're not going to see it. It was just better to make something that's functional and works rather than spending a whole bunch more time building something again from scratch that uh, might look a bit prettier that you're not going to see anyway. But I think that's all the time we have for this week. So I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, for the 1989 season, John Barnard was able to design his first F1 car for Ferrari from the ground up, the 640. This all new design had a narrow monocoque and large side pods, housing the radiators designed for aerodynamic efficiency. In fact, their monocoque is much narrower than their competition, as the 640 was F1's first car to have Ferrari's electro-hydraulic actuated semi-automatic gearbox. This revolutionary paddle shift system meant that the monocoque no longer had to have room beside the driver for the gear shifter and its linkages. However, the new paddle shift system proved to be notoriously unreliable. Also new for the 89 season was the Tipo 35.5, a 3.5 litre V12 producing 660 horsepower. This was similar to the turbo engine it replaced but with better fuel consumption. There was still no match for the 675 horsepower V10 Honda engine used by Ferrari's rival, McLaren. Nigel Mansell won the car's debut at Brazil, but the remaining first half of the season did not see either Ferrari finish a race. Over the summer break, with extensive testing, they found there was not enough power going to the shift unit. They fixed it, the car came back strong, with Nigel Mansell taking out a string of podiums. Gerhard Berger's car still proved unreliable and he suffered a fiery crash at Imola. His injuries prevented him from racing at Monaco, but with the benefit of paddle shift technology, he was able to return the following race. 
The cars had to retire from two thirds of the race that year, but the ones they did finish were all on the podium. However, it was only enough to get them third in the constructors that year. <laughs> all right guys, and today we have another episode of Mail Time, and this time I've got a, uh, a package from Canada. And uh, there is a note. It says, uh, Jeff man, love the builds. I was so inspired by your stuff. I finally got off my ass and picked up an old 1969 Triumph TR6 to rebuild. Uh, and no, it won't be stock. Basically, he's buying an E82 BMW and putting everything from it into the TR6 custom chassis. He's also got a side hustle since his wife got up, ran off the road by a uh, transport truck there in Alberta, Canada, and, um, and designed these Hornetic units. And from what I gather, it's, um, it's basically so you can press your horn down. After about half a second, it switches over to, uh, you can switch over to a second horn, a much louder horn, so you can sort of really let someone know that uh, to get out of the way. So you can still have your little beep beep horn, but you can actually have something secondary and louder with the one horn button. And this is from Howard in Alberta, Canada. So thank you, Howard. And in the package, you also sent me some stickers, and these are to add five horsepower. So uh, let's see if we can make the cabinet a little bit more powerful. And if uh, you guys have got anything you want to send through to me, uh, stickers for the wall or whatever from where you're from, uh, just send them through to Home Built by Jeff, PO Box 1520 Barrel, New South Wales 2576 Australia. All right. Wow. All right. Well, it's uh, it's beginning to look a lot like a uh, uh, an engine. <laughs> uh, the uh, I really like how the ceramic coating has come up on the uh, the headers, even though you're not going to see them. But uh, apparently, this stuff is really good for holding in the heat. Uh, I will be probably I will be putting a a heat shield over the top and also putting some heat shielding on the engine bay itself. I don't have much space to go with, which is one of the main reasons why I wanted to go with this. Um, the the heat wrap is just going to take up too much space, so I think that works better. Alternators on. Uh, the bracket doesn't look anywhere near as ugly once it's bolted on because you can't really see all the, uh, the my, my ugliness, but it works and it'll do the job. That's what we're after. So uh, we are getting back together, getting it ready so that hopefully when we put it in, it can stay as sort of one unit. That's the plan. Sounds like you're dating and getting back together. Yeah. Well, they, hopefully they will date. They will date. They yeah. will become a couple and... Forever. Merge as one. Yes. Never, never to be separated again. Yes. It will go in and stay in. Staying in, not coming back out again. <laughs> oh, I feel like we're tempting oh. fate just saying that. Yes. Yeah. Like and subscribe. Jeff loves to read your comments. If you want to follow him on Patreon, help him out and uh, support this beautiful union. Yeah. Follow yeah. him on Patreon and see the videos a day early with no ads. And. Yep. And we'll yeah. uh, see you on the next one. All right, guys. Have a good one. See ya. To have Ferrari's. Electro actuated no longer had to have room beside the driver for the gear shift for the 35.5, a 3.5 there. It was still no match, however, for Ferrari's main rival. <sighs> <laughs> Nigel, Man the Nigel Manson won the car's debut. Mansell. <laughs> Manson. Manson. <laughs> Nigel Mansell. <laughs> Manson. With use of the paddle shift technology, he was able to return the following time. Yeah. <laughs> Proved unreliable and he suffered a fiery... Excuse me. Oh, safe, Eva. Ugh.